This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. If the holiday season has you feeling a little blue, you are not alone. One in five Americans have a diagnosed mental illness, and a study from the National Alliance on Mental Illness found that the majority of Americans with these illnesses suffer more over the holidays. There are a lot of reasons for that. Stress, changing seasons, worries about money, family strain. But the fact remains, this is a difficult season for many, many people. This podcast is a place for us to talk openly, and we're going to do that. Does the way we approach mental health in this country, diagnosis first, medication centric, actually serve everyone? Or should we redesign mental health treatment to be more holistic? I would never expect a psychiatrist to heal me. Medicine, yes. Alleviating symptoms, yes. But healing is so much more than medicine and a diagnosis. Aaron Grimm, a writer and advocate, joins us in just a moment. Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains to support healthy regularity and your gut, immune, and skin health. Optimize your gut health. Visit seed.com slash Spotify with code Spotify for 30% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Just a note before we get started. This episode will include some very candid discussions of mental illness, mental health crises, and mental health treatment. Our guest, Erin, has schizoaffective disorder and will talk very personally about her experience. Listener discretion is advised. And if you need help, we will share resources in the show notes and at the end of the episode. Many people look forward to the holiday season when they can reconnect with loved ones. For a lot of people, it's a time of celebration and joy. But for others, the end of the year is neither happy nor loving. It is not uncommon for the holidays to bring sadness to people and suffering. But it is important to talk about mental health openly and candidly, especially at an emotionally charged time of year like the one we're in, and frankly, an emotionally charged time in world history. To be clear, we are not doctors. No podcast can substitute for an expert's guidance on this topic or any medical topic. But there is still a taboo surrounding when and whether to talk about mental health treatment, especially when you gather for events. Maybe it's something you'll avoid chatting with relatives about around the holiday table, and we would love to dispel that taboo. So today we will talk about what mental health treatment can and should look like, And whether the most common solutions in this country actually make people feel better in the long run. Erin Grimm is an author and the CEO of Seahurst Wellness and Education Center, and she joins us now. Hello there. Hello. Thank you for having me. So we found you because we read an an op-ed piece that you'd written in the Seattle Times. And the headline was, Why I'm Grateful I Was Forced to Receive Mental Health Treatment. Um... So want to be clear for people that many of the things you're about to talk about are things that you have personal experience with. But could you articulate your point of view? I mean, we, to us, it sounds like what you're saying is psychiatry can be life-saving, but it's not the sort of panacea that many people think they are. Is that a fair representation? I would say yes. And that was my approach before being hospitalized especially. And then once I was hospitalized and rediscovered meaning through methods that weren't hospitalization, I was able to find meaning in life again. But first I had to be forced to take medicine because if I wasn't able to see reality clearly, then I wouldn't have been able to actually make the headway in living in the first place. Over the period of five years, I lost control of my ability to reason, my ability to eat, drink, and function due to psychosis. And I didn't think I needed help. I didn't see myself as sick. And once I was forced to get mental health treatment because I was involuntarily hospitalized, um, they put me on antipsychotics and my delusions broke. Because of the way mental health care is, though, if I hadn't found meaning outside of psychiatry, then I would have probably died 
by suicide because it's so limiting the way psychiatry makes you feel about yourself sometimes. Um, so psychiatry is important. I will always take my antipsychotics. But if I just found meaning and asked for a psychiatrist to heal me, I don't know if I'd be thriving the way I am today. So to be clear, you're talking about psychiatry, which, as a reminder for our listeners, is, is the part of mental health that involves um, drugs, medication. Are you also including psychology in there, talk therapy? I would say that the the issue that I have with talk therapy is that it is, I guess it depends on the therapist. I've always found when I tell therapists that I have schizoaffective disorder, they're more standoffish. Whereas if I'm talking to just a regular person who doesn't know what that means, I can still have a bond. They understand my suffering. They're not afraid of me. And so I do feel like psychology, at least in the United States, and there's multiple psychological frameworks. Yeah. Um, but lots. the typical the typical approach, I feel, leaves me feeling stigmatized when I encounter myself through the eyes of a psychologist. So, you know, immediately... Psychology is a is a field of study that I I work in a lot, so um, this is a perfect subject for us because I I find myself and and having read through many of your writings, I found myself disagreeing strongly. So let me start kind of point by point so we can talk this out. Um, the first thing is that, it, and I get nervous when um, I hear someone. T focusing on the limits of psychology and psychiatry because there already is th there are already so many people who are hesitant to get mental health treatment for so many reasons do you think it's it's uh, i guess safe to um give people who already may be hesitant another excuse not to seek out the the advice of a, an expert Oh, yes, I definitely think that wouldn't be safe. That's why the title of my article was about why I'm grateful I was forced to receive mental health care. I think that it is essential. I just don't think that it's everything. So what does that mean? So through your uh, group, you, you do the, the, the rest of it all, right? Like you fill in the gaps left behind by psychology and psychiatry. Is that fair? Um, no, I think I think what I see myself is... Um, as an option for people finding meaning, because every individual is unique, let alone the cultural differences that we have as, as human beings. And also the, I mean, everybody has a unique psychological fingerprint. So people who find me, who find they resonate, find meaning through some of the structures I provide. But I always am very clear that I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I always recommend people find health care or including psychology. So when you say that it's not everything, what's missing? One of the issues, and I think it's a Western issue in general, is that we think everybody's missing the same thing. Really, for me, what was missing is different from what other people will be missing. Everybody has their own path. And I think that one of the things that was hard for me with psychology was that it wasn't taking that into account all the time. Like, for example, the Diagnostic st Statistical Manual that psychiatry uses, um, it basically is a schematic that you look through symptoms and identify a disorder. And so that's a very rigid structure. It is an art using it to diagnose. Like, I look at the DSM is what it's called. I look at that and I agree, yes, I have schizoaffective disorder. So I'm not saying it's not right. I'm saying that that lens, if that's all we limit ourselves to, denies the full range of human potential. So it should be a tool that helps me take the right medicine, but I don't think that it should be everything. And I feel like depending on the practitioner, and every practitioner is different, but I've been seeking mental health treatment for 10 years and for example, I've never been told that I could have a vitamin deficiency, which I have a B12 deficiency. And my psychosis is much less with a strong B12 supplement. But because it wasn't in the DSM, nobody even recommended I take a B12 supplement. 
So it's like everybody is unique. It's not just here's your symptoms, here's your diagnosis, take your medicine. It's like, let's see what your vitamin panel says. Let's see what your trauma history is. And finding a portrait that is also about what I love and what I believe in, whether I'm Muslim or whether I'm Christian or whether I'm Jewish, whatever I believe, that should be featured in my treatment plan. And I find that that is often lacking. So, I mean, how is that different from the holistic medicine framework, the the physicians who treat a patient, not just in terms of their body, but also their mind and spirit and their emotions? Is, is that similar to what you're talking about? That is an essential aspect of healing, is the holistic movement, the naturopath movement. But I also think psychiatry is essential. Medicine is extremely important for me. So the DSM is valuable. It's just that it shouldn't be everything. Like I tell people, I would never expect a psychiatrist to heal me. Medicine, yes. Alleviating symptoms, yes. But healing is so much more than medicine and a diagnosis. Okay. I, 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 to be clear, you are suggesting that people who have real um, mental illness, a, a, a diagnosable mental illness, do seek treatment and take the medication that's prescribed. Absolutely. And then on top of that, you're saying, and do more. Only if they want to do more. Like if somebody has depression or whatever, and again, I'm not a professional, but if somebody has an incapacitating situation, the last thing I want to do is tell someone what they should do. I'm just speaking from my own experience. Um, It's been a journey. And for me, getting medicine was the first step so that I could tell what was real and what wasn't real. But if I had stopped there, I would have lacked meaning and purpose. And just to name one example, they told me that with psychosis, I should always work. Well, I taught for three extra years because I was afraid to be unemployed because my psychiatrist had said, according to research, you should always have a job. And so I stayed in a career based on psychiatry's you know, top-down formula for what I needed based on my diagnosis. And it made me very, very depressed because I wasn't able to function in my job anymore. I wasn't able to do a good job, but I was afraid to resign because I thought I would have a relapse. And so I, I ended up leaving just because I was so upset. But then I was terrified because I thought, what's going to happen to my mental health? Finally, I started a business And then I was able to go from my heart outward rather than psychiatry telling me what to do. And I was able to thrive. And I ideally am helping others thrive as well. So your group is a a Christian based organization, is it not? Um, I consider myself a Christ follower. I definitely am very receptive and deeply encouraging of all faith traditions. So is that when you talk about needing more, um, you're also talking about spirituality? For me, yes. Okay. But it's also taking vitamins. It's also exercising. It's also going for walks. And that's my fingerprint. That's what my healthcare fingerprint looks like. I'm not telling anyone else what they need to do. All right, we're going to dig into this a little bit more when we come back. We have to take a break. Um, This is the podcast Hear Me Out from Slate. I'm Celeste Headley, and we will be back talking about whether or not psychiatry and psychology really are the one-stop shop for mental health with Erin Grimm. Stay with us. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next?, Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. 
Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. And we're back. Is the only place to get mental health treatment your psychologist's or psychiatrist's office? Erin Grimm says no. And we're talking about it. This is Hear Me Out from Slate. So we were talking about spirituality being part of um, your mental health journey. And I got to say, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Buddhist. I'm not, I don't take anything on faith. But um, I, I, when I when I connect religion, when, when, when we connect religion with mental health, it's not, it sometimes goes wrong, right? I mean, there's yes. the famous Tom Cruise incident where he made fun of Brooke Shields for taking antidepressants because she had postpartum depression and said um, it was irresponsible and said that women should care for themselves with vitamins and exercise. So when you're talking about vitamins and exercise, that I hear Tom Cruise's voice in my head. I'm sure that's incredibly unfair. But right. how yeah, <laughs> resounding a resounding no to that. In fact, I've written two books that are specifically written with a conservative Christian mindset encouraging conservative Christians who are often afraid to take medicine that scripturally medicine can be a means of God's grace in someone's life. I am not a conservative Christian. I am concerned about people who are suffering and who have the Tom Cruise perspective on things, who are afraid to take mental health medication when it can be life-saving and can be a means of God's grace in their lives. So no, I'm not saying just exercise and vitamins at all. I will never stop taking my medicine. So it, it, you're saying that when you go in for treatment with a mental health professional, it sounds like what you're really saying is this is not like uh, getting treated for diabetes. Like you can't, you're not, you don't take the, actually diabetes might be a, a better comparison than I thought because when you are diabetic, it it is more of a holistic treatment. Like you do have to pay attention to what you're eating and how you're sleeping. There are lots of diagnoses that come with not just medication, but a whole lifestyle. That's true. And in fact, that's a brilliant observation because often I say di it's like diabetes in terms of I'll always have to take medicine like a diabetic would require insulin. But I've never thought about that from a holistic lens, like you just said, about how ideally if one has diabetes, they're doing other things as well to care for themselves. Yeah. And that part I fully ag agree with. Um, so maybe we have found a agreement here. Like I absolutely believe that um, uh, mental health treatment from a professional is crucial, but it's supposed to be allowing you to have a healthier and happier life. Is that? Yes. We agree on this. Yes. And I, I also think that it can help you have a more, and I don't mean this at all in a Christian sense. I mean, it can help you have a more moral life. And that is because when you've suffered greatly, you identify suffering in others and are able to resonate with them more. Like, I was just telling my friends, like, in a weird way, I can understand, like, being afraid. Like, for example, when I was psychotic, I thought that everyone thought I was a terrorist. I thought that people were reading my phone. I thought that messages were being intercepted. I thought my email was being monitored. And I have friends in Palestine right now, and that's the reality in the West Bank. And so once you've experienced psychosis, you you see how systemic oppression can actually terrorize your mind. Like it just it's like a it's like chain mail on your mind. So, I mean, I will, uh, let's let's keep going with that, because you're talking about engaging in social justice work as a form of mental health treatment. No, I'm just saying that it can build your empathy because if you've suffered a great deal, then you recognize suffering in others. Like before I was psychotic, I was a Fulbright scholar. I was summa cum laude at Berkeley. I thought people who had mental illness were, I just, I had so many stereotypes. I won't even share them because it would just be traumatic for people listening. But I just had so many negative Completely unconscious. Like if somebody had asked me, what do you think of people with psychosis? I would never have said anything bad. 
But once I was diagnosed with psychosis, I had so much self-hate. And so I do feel like just acknowledging that it gives you a sense of empathy for someone who's just lost their spouse or somebody who's somebody who's just completely struck on the side of the head and doesn't know how to get ahead in life. That feeling of despair of like, I've worked 10 years, have straight A's, Fulbright Scholar, Summa Cum Laude at Berkeley, and now I'm in a psychiatric ward. Being told to undress so they could put a straight jacket on you. I mean, I can't even exactly. imagine. Exactly. Yeah. And and fighting back. Yeah. You know, being that lost that I genuinely feel like someone's trying to kill me. So, yeah, I mean, it's just incapacitating to think about. And so once you've gone that far, then when you when you see other people suffering, it's like a visceral response. You're just like you can't get it out of your head what they must be going through. I mean, I think that. um I agree with that, although I do know that there are some people for whom suffering makes them less empathetic. Uh, I think it can go oh. both ways. Um, but, uh, you know, when uh, every time I'm preparing for one of these uh, disagreement podcast episodes, <laughs> um, I always go and I'm like, all right, let me try and find in their, in their point of view things I could agree with. And I got to say... Um, I, I was thinking about the impact of racism on uh, black people in the United States. Like they just had a study that came out in, I want to say 2020, in which, I mean, we've known for a very long time that experiencing racism lowers your life expectancy and causes all kinds of problems. But this study in recently actually found tangible evidence of it on the cellular level. They found the effect of racism on telomeres, which are these little bits of DNA that protect our cells. And because experiencing long-term racism breaks those telomeres up, weakens them, um, it actually causes African-Americans to age more rapidly. It's embedded at the cellular level. Yes, and also intergenerationally. So the legacy of slavery is actually still experienced bodily. So, I mean, when I say that I found this place where I could I could agree with you, it's because, it, you know, thinking about what you were saying, I was like, I, I thought, you know, it's true that neither psychiatry nor psychology can can help with that. Well, mental health is extremely discriminatory against people of color yes. because often therapists and psychiatrists are white, statistically. And so you can imagine, I can only imagine as a white woman, so I'm not speaking top down like this is anyone's experience, but research that I've studied has said that it is very traumatic, potentially often, um, for somebody to get a mental health diagnosis from a white practitioner who also might dismiss the experience of racism or not pick up on subtle cultural cues that would build empathy in a cross-racial clinical asymmetrical relationship of power where the the person with the power in the notepad is telling a person of color that this is what's wrong with them. If you think about it in the history of racism, in a way the diagnostic statistical manual could be seen as doing that because it's not taking into account how certain cultural aspects are manifesting and it could be treating those clinically as a problem when really it's an aspect of someone's essence. Does that make sense? Like if it's if it's a universal characteristic that's top down and white people are in control of it, that always makes me wonder. Like if you're saying this this set of symptoms means this, well, what's a symptom and what's somebody's culture? And so that's another critique that I'm I'm passionate about, at least elevating as a as a white woman, it's completely inappropriate for me to go further, but I still want to acknowledge that that's another common critique of the DSM. I mean, it, it sounds to me like we agree on this, that yeah. um, there are, are parts of living which can impact your mental health that really, realistically, uh, psychiatry, uh, antidepressants, or talk therapy can't touch. We agree on that, right? 
Well, I do want to say that if we get practitioners of color who are able to really coexist in a in a clinical setting, fully embodied, totally resonating, that could be a space of true transformational healing. And we don't have enough pr- practitioners of color. And then when they when they are, and I don't want, I want to be careful about saying they, so I don't want to be stereotyping. But the research says that when practitioners go through medical training or therapeutic training, some of their cultural instincts and awarenesses are trained out of them because of the whiteness of higher education. And so getting to models that actually allow for practitioners to be themselves and bring their lenses that they're trained in into their own cultural awareness is paramount. So that when, for example, Carter Woodson, who wrote The Miseducation of the Negro, and that's his words, and that's the title. It's a very famous book, so I want to be careful. I'm not saying that word. Well, and it was was appropriate at the time that he was writing. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Um, He talks about, for example, ministers who would go African-American ministers who would go to train at seminaries and come back and not be able to preach captivatingly to their own people because they've been trained by white people on how to do their job. So some of the risk is that by having this whiteness in the higher education space, we're actually, we're actually, we could be causing harm. And so if we could get true models that would allow for people to be culturally themselves in a in a therapeutic room as therapists treating people who look like them who care for them that could be a space of true healing not to say that if there's a white practitioner they couldn't do some of that but there's nothing like people being able to be seen by people who look like them okay we're going to take another short break um, and return to this conversation in a moment this is hear me out a podcast from slate I'm Celeste Headley, and we'll be back with some some closing thoughts here uh, in just a moment. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hear Me Out. It's a podcast from Slate that's all about how to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and the, the point of contention today is how comprehensive a treatment for mental health is psychiatry. Um, there's no question that uh, our guest today, Aaron Grimm, uh, believes medication is crucial and important and valuable. But is it the best and most comprehensive treatment for mental health? Aaron says it, it's not enough. Um, you always need more. Yeah, I think it's not enough is important because it is a pillar of mental health treatment. So I definitely want to say that medicine is essential. For me, I can only speak for myself. And I recommend professional, professional supervision in this. I'm as though the medicine is sort of getting you on the platform where you can then do other stuff. Getting you up getting you up to the point of capability to where you can take on some of these other things that you think are valuable. Exactly. And it also helps me spiritually because I remember thinking I was doing all sorts of stuff on God's advice when I was mentally ill. Clearly, it was a delusion. But at the time, you know, it was spiritually, it felt right. And so um, clearly it wasn't. But with the antipsychotics, then I can have a much more balanced faith life as well. Okay. So when you are talking about how to find those things that that supplement um, psychiatry, this is another sort of, I would think, kind of a danger point. Because when someone is still working on their mental health, and you talk about how you need to um, uh, face reality first, like you have a need to have a realistic view first. Uh, how do, some people aren't always aware when that moment happens, right? Like they yeah. may think they have a realistic view of the world. They may take on activities that they believe are healthy um, 
and are not, are maybe uh, uh, counterproductive, are maybe harmful to other people. So if we are asking other people, if we're asking people to supplement their their psychiatric and psychological treatment with other things, can we trust them to know when and how? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, the Seattle Times actually just ran an article about a gentleman who lived outside. They re- they repeated the community repeatedly tried to help him get housing, and he always graciously declined. And he eventually passed away recently. And um, the article had a wonderful conclusion because it said people might wonder if he needed involuntary treatment and. Really, he wasn't harming anyone. He wasn't harming himself. He was just living outside. And that's a caveat that we need to consider is when is it harmful? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're saying somebody might not know what's best for themselves. And, um, you know, from an outside perspective, that man didn't know what was best for himself. He shouldn't be sleeping outside. That's not safe. But with his integrity, that's what he decided for himself. And that's what he did. However, there's other cases where someone thinks they're doing the right thing and they almost die. Like, um, clearly that needs intervention. Like for me, um, you know, I was I was in the middle of a street raving. And so clearly that wasn't doing the right thing. I needed to be saved from that situation. Um, and that's one of the weird parts about psychosis, right? It's like you can get a good trip or you can get a bad trip. You can live safely relatively on the street or you can be walking mindlessly through traffic you know and so um every case of psychosis is different ellen sachs wrote a great book called the center cannot hold she's a she's a professor and lives with schizophrenia and she talks about how everybody becomes psychotic in a different way there's no one way to become psychotic there are patterns of psychosis like thinking that somebody, me thinking everyone thinks I'm a terrorist. That's a typical psychosis line. But the actual patterns in the psyche are unique to someone, someone's faith tradition, are unique to the news, are unique to one's culture. And so knowing when people need external intervention is completely confusing. There's no way of knowing. There's, there's no way of knowing how it'll turn out. It's interesting you mentioned Ellen Sachs because uh, she also wrote a book called Refusing Care, um, Forced Treatment and the Rights of the Mentally Ill, in which she's talking on. She focuses a lot on over-intervention um, episodes when people are treated against their will. And she talks about the dilemma of forced treatment, using restraints, um, forced hospitalization for people who aren't committing a crime. And she said that the best way to solve all of this is to be, to make sure that um, the the medicine is not, the medical treatment is not neither paternalistic, nor does it invade someone's individual autonomy. But your treatment was life-saving, you've said, and did, did, you know, overstep the bounds of your individual autonomy. Right. And I and again, that's why I can really only speak for myself. I know one time I was literally catatonic in the clinical sense, like unable to speak, unable to move, but I was fully conscious. And my husband got scared because he thought I had overdosed. I couldn't talk to what was going on. And he called the he called the paramedics and they came and I was paralyzed with fear that I was going to be hospitalized again. But I couldn't talk and I just felt so bullied. They told me, you know, well, you're refusing treatment, you're mentally ill, and they were so dismissive, and it had a really Orwellian feel. Like, I was like, oh my God, am I going to be taken to the hospital even though I'm not, even though I'm not harming myself or anyone else just because I'm not functional? And so it was terrifying. So I want to be clear, I'm not saying everybody who's mentally ill should be involuntarily hospitalized um, at all. I'm speaking only for myself. And, and it depends on the episode. Like that time I shouldn't have been hospitalized and I wasn't. But I remember having this really eerie feeling like just because I have this 5150, which is like involuntary hospital hospitalization record in California, you know, that says that that happened. Am I just going to be 
continually open to being hospitalized against my will. And so I love Ellen Sachs. I think she's amazing. She's one of my favorite writers. So in the, the couple minutes that we have left, it, it, um, I mean, I'm still worried about the your message feeding into stigma. I mean, I know that even today when people, I think people believe that there's not a lot of stigma around mental health, but research shows that the the stigma rate hasn't budged all that much, mainly, but maybe maybe by a two, three percentage points are people more, you know, willing to talk about mental health issues with even f- close friends and family. So there's the part of me that's still worried about that. Um, but I f- feel like we also found some points of a- agreement as well. And I guess I just kind of assume that if someone is is interested in their wellness, they're not seeing that medication as the only thing they should be doing to take care of themselves. Do you think people assume that? Um. I don't know what people assume. I think everybody's different. Um, but I do know that um, the issue with psychosis, which is my focus as a researcher and yeah. a memoirist, the by definition, people don't have insight in what's happening to them. In my oh, book, yeah. I talk about how I tell an example. My my grandpa was a polo player. While he was playing polo, a mallet struck his eye. He lost his eye and men looked at him and they were fainting off his their horses because they were just so traumatized seeing like someone without an eye bleeding and they were just, it, I mean, it's a very eerie thing to contemplate really. And so he didn't know that it happened to him and he didn't know he that he had lost his eye. He, he was lost in, his eye? Mm-hmm, he was in shock. It had just happened. And so he was still riding his horse like nothing was going on. And fast forward to me in graduate school, I'm like acting, I'm thinking I'm acting normal and I'm paranoid. I can't keep my office clean. I'm changing advisors all the time and everyone knows something's wrong and I had no idea. And even if somebody had suggested that I was losing my mind, I would have been offended and outraged. And so there's a book I highly recommend that is called I... I'm not sick and I don't need help or something to that extent. And it's about family members trying to come around somebody who is clinically lacking insight into their condition. To this day, my husband, when I when I get really excited about doing something, he has sort of like a sense of PTSD around me being really motivated to do something just because I was really motivated to, you know, drive across the country and live in my car, you know, and then the next day I'd be really motivated to go to Russia and the next day I'd be, you know, so he just gets a little bit triggered when I'm really (laughs) excited about something. Understandable. That book, by the way, if any readers are interested, is is by a doctor, a clinical psychologist called Dr. Xavier Amador. And I am not sick. I don't need help. That's exactly what the title is. Um, But look, it has been a true pleasure to talk to you. And, And if nothing else, I think being able to talk this openly about uh, mental health, about the issues may one, ha- one have, you know, in the end, it will have an effect on the stigma around it and hopefully encourage other people to have these common conversations too. Yes. And I do think that one of the most important things I can do is speak about my own experience. That's all I can do, really. I can shed light on other things I've read, but the more people with mental illness tell their stories, the more the stigma breaks down. If this conversation was at all triggering or upsetting for you, we want to make sure you know you are not alone. If you need help, the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline offers 24-7 support. All you have to do is text or call 988 or visit 988lifeline.org. You can also scroll down to our episode notes for more resources we're sure that you have thoughts on this topic. Um, And we hope this conversation has proved that it is important to talk about this stuff honestly and productively. And so part of that is getting your response. You can share your thoughts and experiences by emailing us. It's hearmeout at slate.com. Every time we talk about mental health, we can help address society's stigmas on this topic and break apart that stigma just a little bit more. Hear Me Out is a podcast from the Slate. 
The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind, but keep it open. <laughs>